morning. Jesus continued. There was a man who had... Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together, all he had, and set off for a distant country. And there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizens of that country who sent who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods of, that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine is dead, lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Okay, one of my favorite songs, of course, we found out yesterday since we sung it like three times, right? Uh, that's one of my favorite songs. So we're going to sing it this morning before his message. Um, and so altos, we'll start, and then sopranos, and then tenors, and then bass. Altos.
in Sopranos. the microphone this morning. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Um, if I did not hug you this morning, <laughs> if I did not shake your hands, it's not because I don't love you. It's because I do love you and I do not want to get you sick. If you are visiting with us this morning, please stand up. If you are visiting with us, don't be shy. I know some of you are. It's okay. It's okay. All right. Guys, give them a hand. Thank you guys for being here so much. We appreciate it. Yeah, good. Thank you guys so much for being here, and we certainly pray and hope that today is not the last day we're going to see you. We pray that we'll see you again. And Waterbury Church of Christ, let's make sure we keep this thing going. We keep this momentum going. Inviting folks, telling folks about the love of Jesus, telling folks about our Savior and our Redeemer. You know, let the Holy Spirit move in our hearts so that we can be soul winners for the kingdom. You know, <clears throat> um, I want to thank Brother Jonathan and his family, uh, Georgia, his two kids, they are here as well. They came all the way from New York to be with us. You know, they are good friends of ours, good friends of my wife. Um, thank you guys so much. I will appreciate you, brother. You know, I ask that you guys keep them in your prayers um, as they will be making some transition in their lives, you know, real soon. And we pray that God will provide you with some guidance in your life. Um, this morning, you know, since my voice is not what it usually is, you know, we're going to tweak things around a little bit, you know, and I really hope you guys can hang in there with me. So, based on the passage of scripture we just read, Luke chapter 15, I want us to, I want to speak on the subject of, well, welcome home. That's, that's what I entitled this message. Welcome home. You know, in Romans chapter 15, verse number 7, Paul encourages the church in Rome to welcome one another, just as Jesus welcomed us to the glory of the Father. So this morning, we welcome you to the house of the Lord. Amen. And I want to spend the rest few minutes um, focusing on what is it about the church that would make anyone feel welcome? What is it about this congregation that would make anyone want to be here and feel part of this church family? Waterbury Church of Christ is my church home, so I want to welcome you home. But there has to be something in this place 
that makes you feel welcome. So let's start this way. How many of you have seen this movie? I mean, if you have not seen this movie, let me just stop and say, you're not a true American. <laughs> it's just one of those classic family-oriented movies that you have to see with your family. You know, if I remember this movie correctly, the first part of the movie, Dorothy spent her time trying to get away from home. But when she winds up in Oz, she spent the next part of the movie trying to get back home. Yeah. Only to find out later, you know, a magician, I don't know what she was, only to find out all she had to do was to click, to go like this three times, and she had to say, it's, there's no place like home. And she kept on saying that. And then she got home. What about Church of Christ? To me, there's no place like home. And I'm talking about this place. I'm talking about this church. I've been here for nine years. I went through a lot. Some of it because of my own doing. And I still believe there's no place like home. There's no place like home because when I went through the things I went through, a lot of you stood by me. There's no place like home because when I found myself in some deep trouble, I knew there were some folks up in here I could count on. There's no place like home. You know, working with teenagers over the years, I've heard several of them say, I can't wait to leave home. Can you believe your teenagers say that? I can't wait to go away to college and have my freedom and be away from my parents and be away from all these rules, all those restrictions. I can do whatever I want, go to bed whenever I want, drive my car wherever I want. I don't want to be home. Only to find out when they are away from home. Mama ain't may be there to cook for you. You got to pay your own bills. You got to find out what it is that you got to do to make it through the day. Many of them, many of teenagers I know who leave home, they find themselves going back home. Because it is not what you thought it would be being away from home. Folks, that's kind of the story that Luke chapter 15 is about. You know, when I was a teenager, I remember I had the same mindset. So I said, I, I, I can't remember what was going on, but I wanted to do something, and my parents wouldn't let me go. So I decided, well, I'm going to leave this house. So I went to my friend's house, and that's the thing about being home. I went to my friend's house, a place where I knew I was welcome, a place where I could eat whatever I want. But I went there, I spent one night, and my friend's parents look at me, it's time for her to go home. When I lived with Jim and Julie for like a few months, they made me feel welcome. I ate from their fridge anything I want. They treated me just like Jason and Jeremy. But there was a time I was sitting on the couch, Jim came by next to me, says, Donnie, you need to get your own place. <laughs> it's not because he doesn't love me. But the truth is, it ain't my home. There is no place like home. Whenever I have my friends, Rob and Sam, come to the house, or I go to their house, we feel comfortable over there. When I go to Rob and Sam's house, I don't need to ask him for a drink. I just go to the fridge and get whatever I want. But guess what? It ain't my home. Because at home, I can sit down, walk around without my shirt on, and do things I can do in their house. There is no place like home. What about a church? What is it about this church that should make people feel welcome to be here? What is it about us that are attracted to folks when it comes to Christianity? Teenagers say they want to leave home. But when they leave, they want to come back. And one thing I notice is that the reason why a lot of us love the holidays is because we get to go home. 
It's because we got to stay home and be with family and enjoy a lot of things. You know, so as we think about our home and the reasons why we love to be home, I want you to think about this lesson in Luke chapter 15. So before we get into the text, <clears throat> I want you to remember that Jesus told three specific stories in that text. The first one, he told, the, he told a story about the lost sheep, and he told a story about the lost coin and the lost son. You know, in each of these stories, Jesus is putting a greater emphasis on the value of what is lost. The first one is an animal. The second one is money. The last one is a human being. The first one is an animal. Let me put it that way. I don't know if I've ever told you this story, but I also stayed with Todd and Aaron one summer. And they left, went on vacation, and I stayed in their house, and all I had was one job. Take care of the dog. That was one job. Lo and behold, I let that dog out. That dog never came back that night. <laughs> that dog's name was Shay. I will never forget Shay, Todd and Aaron. And I, 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 I was driving all over the neighborhood looking for Shay. That's one animal. And I call Aaron. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Aaron was like, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I guess it ain't no big deal. But finally, the next day, someone in the neighborhood called me. Thank you, my brother. That's why I love working with him. <laughs> Someone in the neighborhood called me and told me to get the dog. So when I went to that person's house, I got the dog. I was so excited. That dog was lost, but she is now found. Hallelujah. <laughs> They're not going to kick me out of the house because I found their dog. <laughs> you know, so it's the same thing that's going on with the lost sheep. 100 sheep. One is lost. The shepherd took the time to go find it. In the second story, it's the lost coin. Ten coins. One is lost. Let me, let me put it that way. Have you ever lost some money? Listen, the other day, I lost $10. I forgot which pants I was wearing when I lost that money. I spent 30 minutes looking for $10. Some of you might be thinking, oh, it's just $10. No, it's not just $10. It's like three gallons of gas. That's what it is. <laughs> a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread. I have a baby. That's, that's like two or three diapers or something. <laughs> I got to find my money. You know, when you lose something that is of value to you, right. you're going to take the time to find whatever it is that you lost. So the next story, the lost son. How many people are lost today? just like the prodigal son. What a bad church. Are we taking the time to seek and save the lost and take them home in the church where they belong? You see, when Jesus Christ told these three stories, he was answering a question because at that time, the Pharisee, they were complaining and questioning the fact that Jesus was spending so much time with sinners and tax collectors. So Jesus told them why. Because sinners are lost, and I need to find them and bring them home. If you don't remember anything from this lesson this morning, I want you to understand one thing. Sinners are lost. I need to find them and bring them home to Jesus. That's what this thing is about. Brothers and sisters, they, the Pharisees, they seem to forget that Jesus Christ did not come for people who believe they are self-righteous. Jesus Christ did not come for people who believe they are well, who believe that they got it going on. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus, came, Jesus says, I came to bring sinners to repentance. So I believe that is why the church needs to be a welcoming place. What is the church? Let me redefine that for you. The church is a place where sinners are being saved. The church is a place where people who are lost in the world, filled of darkness, can come here and find themselves in the name of Jesus. That is what the church is about. Brothers and sisters, are we looking for these folks who are lost and to bring them home? 
to Jesus. Oh, it's good to be home. You know, <clears throat> every time, every time I go home, every time I go home, and by home, I mean back home, Haiti, every time I go there, my parents meet me at the airport and they give me a big old bodacious hug and, 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 and they love on me and they say, welcome home. You know, all these words just warm my heart. There's nothing like home because there's something you need to understand, especially in connection to this story, is that whenever I go home to Haiti, I understand there are certain things I can only get at home. You know, I know many of you love me, and when I go to your house, you make me feel good, and you feed me well, but I'm here to tell you this morning, sometimes, Donny Pierre wants some, I want some neck bone. <laughs> I want some chicken feet. Yeah. You know, some of you don't even understand what I'm talking about. I want some yams, you know, and I can only get, you can't get that at Stop and Shop. <laughs> you know, I can only get that at home. So I want to, you know, I know some of you are good cooks, but nobody can cook like my mama <laughs> and my wife. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> you know, you can think you can cook, but these women can cook, and they feel me real good. Amen. That's why I love to be home. You see, the first thing in this story that I want you to understand is that the reason why I believe the church is a welcoming place is because we have God's providence. At home, we are provided for, aren't we? You know, um, I remember a couple of weeks ago, I was at home going over a couple of stacks of bills, like a lot of them. You know, so as I was looking at these bills, a lot of them are hospital bills. You know, I don't know much about health insurance, but one thing I do know, having a baby is expensive. Okay? And I have bills at the house to prove it. So what I'm saying here is that if you, uh, if you like, you know, something that bothers me when people walk to me and they're like, uh, when are you going to have that, that other baby? You know what I want to answer to you? Uh, are you going to pay for it? <laughs> but anyway, I was going over those bills, and, and I turned over and looked at my wife, and I said, baby, why did we have to grow up? Because one thing I understand, when I was a child, when I was a teenager, I didn't have to worry about these things. These things were provided for me. Jamal doesn't wake up in the morning and stop complaining, Lord, how am I going to pay for my school lunch? He doesn't, he just, these things are just provided for him. Your teenagers, they don't walk away, oh Lord, how am I going to pay for this mortgage? Your parents provide that for you. As far as they are concerned, it's free. So what I'm saying here is that we need to understand when you are in the Lord's house, when you are God's child, you don't need to go around worrying about the necessities of life because God is your provider and I believe he will provide. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, so one of the reasons why it's good to be home is because at home, I am provided for. I am cared for. It's good to be in the Lord's house because in the church, we are taken care of by our Father in heaven. You know, <clears throat> we're talking about the necessities, of, the necessities of life. Think of it that way. Parents, you provide food, shelter, electricity for your children, internet. Let's not forget about internet. I mean, I believe if Jesus Christ were living in the 21st century America and were to be preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he would have mentioned internet and smartphone as a necessity of life for them teenagers. You know, as a matter of fact, when teenagers come to you, not only teenagers, adults, when they come to your house, they don't even ask you if you have internet. They just assume that you have it. They ask you, what's the password? Yes. So it's like internet is just a necessity of life for those folks. So you provide all these things, but 
there are some rules and responsibilities that children in your house need to live by. When God provides for you, there are some rules in the house of the Lord and responsibilities that we need to live by. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You know, so what I'm trying to say here is that we need to understand in the church, God does not only provide the necessities of life, but God also provides guidance for us to live by. You know, so what am I trying to say? Brothers and sisters, when you are provided for, you need to be grateful. When you are taken care of, you need to be grateful. You know, one of my job, one of my responsibilities when I was a teenager is to make sure I thank my mama for everything. You know, my father would say, hey, did you thank your mama? I needed to make sure I was grateful for everything. You know, so when we are in the Lord's church, we need to have that attitude. Hey, the reason why we are welcome here, the reason why we are comfortable in the Lord's church is because God is taking care of us. So thank you, Lord, for everything you've done. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for providing for me. You know, so thank you, Lord, for giving me all these blessings in my life. You know, so... As we think about it, I want us to sing this song. I told you it's going to be a little different this morning, plus I need to rest my voice. So Jonathan's going to help us sing this song. Come on. Being at home, we are provided for, just like this young man was provided for when he was home with the father. But not only that, the reason why home is a welcoming place, the reason why the church is a welcoming place, it's because of God's love. The reason why home is comfortable, it's because I know my parents love me. You see, the, the Bible says the father ran and met him. He ran and met him. He didn't wait for that young man to get all the way to him. As soon as he saw him, he ran and met him more than halfway. God is capable of meeting you where you are. You got to be willing to come to him. Because if you remember in the text, the young man said, the Bible says, when he came to his senses. I mean, this boy must have lost his mind leaving home and thinking it was going to be better. But he came to his senses and realized he was wrong. So he went, you see, love is the reason why we are forgiven. Love is the reason why God provides. The father fell on his neck and kissed him. That is not only a sign of love, that is a sign of forgiveness. You know, sometimes we are fighting with our children or our, or our spouse, right? And we, we, we're talking, we agree, oh, I forgive you, it's cool. But really, it, it's not cool. It ain't cool until you hug and kiss each other. You know, to me, whenever I read this story, and the Bible says he fell on his neck and kissed him. And the thing is, the father, he didn't start by saying, well, did you learn your lesson? Oh, I, I told you it was going to be hard out there. He didn't say none of that. He said, Father, I'm sorry. I am a sinner. I was wrong. The father accepted that and kissed him 
because he loves him. You see, the thing about love is that the church is a welcoming place because of love. In the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew chapter 22, I believe, the Bible, Jesus Christ says there are two commands. The greatest command, love God, love people. Love God, love people. You know, the greatest command, it's, it's, it's so amazing. If we do not have love in this place, it is not a welcoming place. So this being said, once again, help us sing this song, folks.
Jesus is God's grace. So when we're talking about seeing God's grace in the church, we're talking about broken lives, being made whole. We're talking about people accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. When folks come in here, if we want them to see the grace of God, we need to have them understand that the grace of God is manifested in Jesus Christ. Not in the preacher, not in the elders, not in the deacons, or any member for that matter. It's Jesus who is the grace of God. So church, as we are closing, I hope you are welcome here. And I hope we can go out there and tell somebody. Because when you look at the story in Luke chapter 15, it's understanding that people are lost. We need to go find them and bring them home to Jesus. That's the story. People are lost in their sin. We need to go and find them, not wait for them to come to us, but go and find them and bring them home to Jesus. So we are going to stand and we are going to sing. And I'm going to ask you if there is anybody here would like to accept the grace of God in his life or her life. Come on up. The water is warm. The clothes are ready. I will not do the baptism. I will not put my hands on you. I promise that. And you will be saved. And that is how you accept the grace of God. We're going to sing a song. Come on, guys. Let's stand and sing.